Hello again. Today I'm going to play one of the most difficult factory mods in Minecraft, Enigmatica 2 Expert. This collection of mods allows realistic chemical factories, space travel, god equipment, insane boss fights, and a lot more stuff, taking 500 hours of my life away from two separate playthroughs. Over the past two months, I've posted a bit of E2E content showing the last 40 hours of my playthrough, and a lot of you wanted to see the full thing, but I only started recording after getting the creative tank. This video, however, I will show the full history of my playthrough. Before that, I want to let you know that I have a small Discord server with some of my subscribers and even God himself on there, and if you join, he will bless you. Also, I will let you into a competitive modded server I'm starting relatively soon, also subscribe. Anyways, let's get back to E2E. In case you don't know what E2E is, it stands for Enigmatica 2 Expert, which, as you may have expected, is the expert version of Enigmatica 2. The pack is centered around the Gates quest line, which is a comprehensive progression line for the pack, with each vertical level on the quest line being tiers in progression, starting with Industrial Age mods in tier 1, all the way to Blood Magic, Warp Drives, and God Equipment at tier 4, setting it apart from its non-expert version. It is mainly centered around these tech mods with magic on the side, and the end goal is to make the four creative items to make the creative vending upgrade to duplicate any item including itself in a drawer. Once you make that, you are essentially in creative mode and can do whatever you want, and it is the pack I will be playing today. It all started in November of 2021, when I was talking to my friend about possibly playing modded Minecraft together. Before this, I had only really played two mod packs, Sevtech and Sky Factory but I had never beat any mod packs, and Sky Factory got boring after the first two hours. So this friend showed me a video created by the YouTuber I go by lots of names about Enigmatica 2 Expert, and I was interested. Pretty soon, however, we realized we didn't know how to do multiplayer, and gave up. But the next day I started a single player world, and the grind began. I started by looking at the pack's quests to figure out the best way to progress, and decided that I would get all the way up to here in the start quest line, and then move to my favorite mod at the time, Immersive Engineering. On day one, I made a tiny Tinker's Construct smeltery, which is like a dwarven forge, to melt metals and cast them into tools, and used it to get my first copper tool, allowing me to mine surface quartz, to sharpen it, and then back to the mines for iron. This long mining level progression was actually quite interesting to me, and was probably the only reason I kept playing since I had no experience automating things, no knowledge of applied energistics, and was completely overwhelmed by how bad the late game recipes looked. My goal was to stick to what was familiar, so I rushed the thermal series of mods and nuclear craft because I couldn't reach big reactors like I wanted to. What, what, what the hell? No! And then after that I would go for the only ore generation I know, Mystical Agriculture, which allows you to grow various materials with plants. By the end of the first week, I had an immersive engineering setup and an ME drive for digital storage. Nice. It was quickly becoming apparent that my goals were stupid, since crafting the machine case for thermal was way too difficult and involved my two greatest enemies, forestry and industrial craft. Once I got the machine case though, I realized that all this brute force up to thermal was exhausting, and for what? All I had acquired with it was a redstone furnace and an induction smelter, but in getting those I learned about the nuclear furnace and the nuclear craft alloy smelter, which rendered them useless. To get my mind off these failures, I went for the last goal, which is resource generation, and after almost a month of learning Thomcraft, a week of astral sorcery, and another week of messing around in Botania, I failed. A week later, my computer was reset with a new SSD, and the old hard drive was just gone. So the first attempt ended with absolute failure on all fronts. I stopped playing and moved on to some Factorio and Terraria. But this story doesn't end here. After three months of a Factorio playthrough with a friend that eventually abandoned the playthrough, I was inspired to continue E2E, and sometime in late February 2022, I started the second attempt. I had no logical reason to do so, and with my lack of skill, I should have just turned around and played something else. But I was going to try this, and not expect anything out of it. When I loaded in, I was facing directly into dirt, and was surrounded by ocean. I had the worst possible spawn, at the edge of an alps biome, with mountains going more than 150 blocks high, surrounded by a vast ocean. Now I had to climb all the way up to the top to see if there were any trees. 
So far, so good. I eventually found this house and destroyed it and its inhabitants to get furnaces and chests, which have their recipes slightly modified in this pack, and then made a boat and sailed in a random direction. Once I landed, I made a sort of log cabin, which to this day has not been completed. And then I made a smeltery just like last time. Unlike last time, however, I wanted to go big. I've learned about UU Matter from Industrial Craft, which in E2E essentially allows you to turn energy into these important items. Energy is very easy to get infinitely, so the new plan was to get progression in the major tech mod mechanism and use its tools to help with getting UU Matter. And then I had a vague idea of getting the laser drill for ore generation. So in the spirit of this new big mindset, I made a triple layer smeltery, able to smelt 27 ores at once, and then immediately started immersive engineering, with a coke oven for coal coke and steel in this blast furnace. The steel and blast brick was used with blocks of osmium to get my first mechanism machine case, used to get this, a metallurgic infuser. And after making this machine, and this machine, and all these machines, and all this, I had my masterpiece. An ore purification setup. At this point, I was getting kind of addicted, and a theme was setting in. Lack of resources. So I was having power problems with my new machine upgrades, and with me now wanting to get some thermal foundation machines to also work towards the void miner, I needed lots more power, and hydrogen gas burners, solar, and wind power was just not enough. So I decided that I needed to make a nuclear reactor. The biggest part of this was getting lead, and that meant mining. Lots of mining. Then I needed lithium, steel, and boron for all of this, and the advanced plating used with the basic plating to make the reactor controller, and finally the casing. But first, more mining. I made the reactor, but realized that keeping it on was annoying, so it stayed off 40% of the time, but the lack of resources was becoming a big problem, to the point where I was using the minimum level of machines with these low-level leadstone flux ducts due to budget cuts. So naturally, to fix this, I forgot about it, and made a computer storage system. The next goal on my list was the Angel Ring, which allows creative-like flight as long as you have what's called grid power, most of the time produced by these things called water mills. Why I wanted this was so that I could travel easier and also move around my base easier since I had an idea to widen the spaces to allow flight. I began work on this and it only took two days even with my unautomated resource empty base, and while on call with my friend, I took off for the first time in the playthrough. To fix this, I left the game and said that I would never play again. But again, you could probably tell there's a lot left in this video. I started an E2E save with another friend which ended with him using way too many materials and then trying to tell me that the earth is flat. So after that I decided I would research why I died using the angel ring and figured out that it was because I was unloading the water mills and lost all my grid power. So I'd just have to chunk load them. So I did that. And it worked. E2E was back. Coming back to the playthrough, I realized that, frankly, my base was dog crap, and I needed to make a new one. In my Nomi Factory playthrough that I had for two days, I had a base plan underground with floors circling a pit in the middle, down to lava. It was also going to be organized with the top floor being power generation, second floor being general machines, third floor being magic, fourth floor being endgame, and bottom floor being advanced rocketry multi-blocks. Getting on for the first time in two months, I immediately made an Electrum and Steel Hammer to mine nine blocks at a time to dig the new base. Once set up, I moved the nuclear reactor and six new wind turbines in, and once the machine line was set in place, I moved the computer storage system, and after tearing up everything left at the old base, it was time to do some progression. The first thing I wanted was the previously mentioned UU Matter setup, and to do that I needed advanced alloy, 
and carbon plates for these three machines. There's also all of these materials, which needed quite a few extra machines. Lapitron has a recipe that looks like this, and was the hardest part, but to me, only meant I needed a compressor. Advanced alloy and carbon plates also needed the compressor, and the rest just took a couple hours to make in the crafting table. I soon learned the immense power cost of UU Matter, which I spent two days trying to negate with this scrapper wall, where I learned about item ducts which would be used for the rest of the playthrough. But it still wasn't enough. I had never automated nuclear fuel, so the reactor was unreliable, and wind power wasn't scalable enough to reach my power demands. Trust me, I tried. So I did some research and found the gas turbine, which is an easily expandable turbine that runs on gases like hydrogen or ethylene. So I made the first major spaghetti factory of the playthrough for automatic ethylene, and the turbine produced over 10,000 RF, which is energy units, every tick, which is a 20th of a second, so 200,000 RF a second. With power fixed, I moved back to UU Manor, where I looked at the crystal memory required for teaching it what to duplicate. This required one new machine, the pressurizer from Nuclearcraft, which is when I fully learned how useful Nuclearcraft would be throughout the playthrough. This is also around the time I learned about Applied Energistics Autocrafting. How autocrafting works is when you have a computer storage system, from now on referred to as a Matter Energy, or ME system, with just this ME drive and a terminal like I did, the terminal uses one channel, and the drive uses one channel. I don't know where the channels come from for now, but there are eight channels, or whatever you want to do with storage. But storage is the only thing you can do until you get an ME controller which can add up to 32 channels per side, limited by the cable, and allow interface and crafting storage usage. Interfaces allow you to add crafting patterns in them and link up molecular assemblers and automatically craft items on demand. It gets complex when you use processing patterns, which are way more flexible when you code the individual items and what comes out. So in my first auto crafting system, I have an electric furnace here and an interface here. The interface puts iron dust into the redstone furnace, and expects iron ingots back. The furnace outputs into the interface and is sent into storage. This can also be chained together where you order iron bars, for example, and if you've coated the recipes, it'll crush iron ore into dust and then smelt it. This system can grow almost infinitely, and led to some truly beautiful contraptions way later in the pack. The size of this playthrough was finally setting in. I had gotten farther than last time, and even farther than I ever thought I could go. I had UU Matter, a huge base, and I felt like an absolute genius after figuring out autocrafting. What started as a small Minecraft playthrough just for fun after the collapse and burnout of every other game I had played, became a dedicated quest to get to the end. And I was routing the entire thing now. I was also now taking screenshots of my progress, finally adding documentation, and my playtime had risen from 1 to 2 hours a day to 5 to 8 hours, speeding up my progress and getting me to learn way more to prevent most of the old mistakes I made. My next faraway goal was the Void Miner, which needed many things that we'll get to, but the first and most important material was the Iridium Reinforced Plate. Iridium needed some new machines, including the induction smelter to make. The induction smelter is from one of the major tech mods in E2E, Thermal Foundation, which is the most commonly seen tech mod in any mod pack on this version. There's one problem, I needed the machine frame, which is what I spent most of last attempt trying to reach, only to learn that it's not even that useful. This time it is useful, but there's still the roadblock of that recipe, so I began making my way through forestry and actually additions to make the iron casing, and then moving into industrial floor going a bit more, and finally the RF tools machine frame to get the machine frame much easier than last attempt. And then I made the redstone furnace for high speed and auto smelting, and then the previously mentioned induction smelter and made iridium. The next difficult material is lithrite, which needs another thermal foundation machine, the fluid transposer, and to let it run I needed the magma crucible. To make lithrite I need to melt this material called enderium in a magma crucible, and then put molten enderium into the fluid transposer, then put a terrestrial artifact in the fluid transposer to get one lithrite. I need to do this 36 times. The difficult part is the terrestrial artifact since enderium's main cost is platinum, which I got when making iridium. Terrestrial artifacts need the empowerer, which is an actually additions machine that uses these four display stands around it to function. 
To start this, I needed the Atomic Reconstructor, the main machine for actually additions, and I used it to turn quartz into ethic quartz for the five display stands, and then used one of those with iron casing to make the Empowerer, and used it to make eight of the nine crystals needed for the terrestrial artifact. Why didn't I get the last crystal? Well, because... Diamonds are the... wait... Diamatine is the hardest part of the recipe since it needs exotic materials like mana diamonds, zirconium, and malachite. Zirconium just needed a new machine, which was getting annoying to do, so I added the alloy smelter to auto crafting so that I could automate tough alloy. Mana diamonds are made in the mana pool, which means I need to break the contract with the UN about never using a magic mod again. And I had to get through Thomcraft, Astral Sorcery, and finally reach Botania. Wait, no, 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 no. I. Fun fact about malachite, it's a form of copper ore that is fairly common in real life, its chemical formula is this if you care, but for some reason I can't just find malachite in the ground because for some reason they removed it. So I had two options here make a different kind of laser drill that was very expensive and I'd rather not talk about it, or use these sieves with endstone gravel to find all of these gems, which included malachite. With Botania unlocked, I could make the Botania items required for the sieve, and get the final item for the terrestrial artifact. There's one last problem for making the void miner that I didn't think about before. It's a multi-block, which means there are, you guessed it, multiple blocks. The only blocks that matter here, though, are the structure frames, which look cheap here until you look at the interconnect, which needs these connectors, which needs tin. Lots of tin. So much tin, in fact, that it was time for. With this new cost and how deep crafting trees are getting, I need to look into auto crafting and try to get some larger systems. I thought about what was necessary to expand auto-crafting and figured out that if crafting computers and interfaces could be easily auto-crafted, then I could expand it at will to every conceivable machine almost effortlessly. So that's exactly what I did. The other problem, which isn't solved by 200 auto-crafting patterns, is tin. I needed lots of tin. The Paris Catacombs under my base has a sustained ore collection until now, but growth was getting stunted by my two-hour mining trips every week. I needed another source of ore collection that isn't the Void Miner since I can't get that yet, and that's when my Sky Factory brain kicked in. I have a sieve now, and that's the only ore collection method in Sky Factory. Surely I could make some system to automatically make metal out of infinite cobblestone in E2E, right? Upon further inspection, yes. I could use the Nuclear Craft Cobblestone Generator to produce 8 stone a second, and put it into mechanism crushers, and then sieve the gravel created in that to make various exotic metals. So I immediately got to work making the machines for that, and used import buses from Applied Energistics to bring it all straight to storage. Suddenly making the void miner doesn't seem that good, but I'm too invested now. It also makes lithrite automatically, and I thought if a cheap sieving setup was enough to fill my storage system while I was at church for an hour, then the laser drill should be good, right? So I kept going and automated ore doubling by putting ore in an enrichment chamber, to make two dust from one ore, and then putting the dust in the previously mentioned redstone furnace. Then I grew crafting storage to support the huge recipe to make over a thousand tin blocks required for all the connectors for the void miner, and at the end of the tenth month, I had the drill. I turned the miner on, and watched one measly ore every three seconds go into the crate. Well, there are three good things that came out of this. I got lithrite, I learned that sieving is actually useful, and I got the achievement of actually reaching one of these far-fetched goals. So what's next? I decided that I needed to make more power since I goofed the ethylene setup and didn't want to fix it. So I began thinking about forms of power gen. Auto uranium into low enriched uranium fuel for huge fission reactors. A bigger gas setup. Maybe thousands of wind turbines. Eventually, I came to a conclusion. For this I needed resources, lots of them. I needed 700 steel, 1000 lead, 700 boron, 1400 lithium, over 10,000 redstone, and hundreds of solenoids. This was going to be a huge project for just a minimum size fusion reactor. Most of that I already had, so the main roadblock was redstone. Since I didn't have sand sifting yet, 
Redstone had to be made with the Void Miner, and the same goes for Lithium and Boron. So I ended up making the Tier 2 Void Miner to get as much as possible. I then had to help it get resources since it was so slow, so I mined for the Lithium and Boron and put a red lens on the Void Miner to increase the chance for getting Redstone. After five play sessions of either idling or mining, I had the resources and it was time to build. Once that was all put together, I made 14 pumps with speed upgrades and filters to get heavy water, which I electrolyzed to get one bucket of deuterium every second. And finally, with the combination of all my power production flowing into the electromagnets to power up the most expensive machine I had ever owned, I could finally turn on the fusion reactor. With no outside input, this reactor was producing nearly 500,000 RF a tick, and power had truly been solved. With the fusion reactor, auto crafting, and auto sieves, I had a fully self-sustaining base, ready to enter tier 4 mods like Ender.io. For right now, I'll have to end the video here.